Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, let me invite you to go ahead and, uh, and grab a seat as folks are coming in. Uh, we're so glad for you to be uh, with us this morning as we come to, to worship our God. Crossgate is a community of believers who, who are in need of God's grace. Uh, so if you're in need of God's grace this morning, you are in the, in the right place uh, and with, uh, with fellow strugglers. But our God is great and he gives himself to us and has given his son for us. Uh, the community that needs God's grace and wants to share that grace with one another. And that's even part of what we do in worship. Our focus in worship isn't just on one another. Our focus is on, on the Lord, on who he is as that one who is, has all sufficiency uh, and gives himself to us. Um, if you're on the inside of the aisles, if I can invite you to grab the uh, registration pads and pass those down, uh, just, just one of a number of ways that we would love to, to get to know you and love for you to get to know uh, us at Crossgate, whether you're um, a new uh, visitor or whether you've been here for a long time. Uh, we'll encourage you when you have chances for conversation, like coming in, that y'all are talking with one another. I think that's just always a good sign of community uh, and to not rush right out, but take a moment after the service to, to look at other people that are here and say, who do I not know? Uh, who have I not seen in a while, or who can I connect, connect with, and just see how God is at work through those things. Uh, I want to mention a few announcements, and one of those is the, um, uh, the missions giving card uh, that's an insert in your bulletin. We had our missions conference just a, a few weeks ago, and um, I really want to encourage uh, just a, a wide response to our missions at Crossgate. I love how much this church, uh, for the first times that I, I knew about Crossgate, just how much there's a love uh, for missions. Not only what is God doing here, but what is God doing other places in the world, and how does he use us to be part of that? Uh, so a fair portion of just the regular tithes and offerings goes toward that. But a lot of our, our missions budget, some of these missionaries that we support, a lot of that comes uh, from your, your givings from the congregation that go to the missions fund. Um, and so it helps us as we set those budgets, as we've seen that kind of goal that was on the back of the card other weeks, um, to say, here's what we're committing to. We want to support all these missionaries, uh, but it helps us to know kind of what your, your pledges are toward that. Um, and sometimes I think folks will go, well, if I'm going to give a, a big amount, then I'll, I'll put that on there so you know some of that with a pledge. But, but really, whether you're giving a gift, uh, large or small, uh, please fill this out. Uh, I would love for us just to be able to see that throughout the congregation, here's, here's this many pledges that the, that the church has received that are going into this, um, that part of it is that we see that we are together about this work of missions. Uh, and one of the ways that you show that, you're, that you want to be part of that and are praying toward uh, those works is uh, you can fill this out and drop it in the offering boxes in the back near the door. Or you can go online and fill that out as well. That's anonymous. This is not something that we follow up with you and we said, you put this amount, where's these things? That's... Um, it's just a, like it's a free will offering. This is just a way to say we want to be part of missions and we want the church to, uh, to know that and to, um, to see this is widely supported through the congregation. So I just encourage you, we'll, we'll probably have that in the bulletin maybe one more week, uh, but then there'll be some in the, in the foyer that you can grab throughout the year. But um, just encourage you to uh, be part of that. Uh, we're excited that our uh, Cuba team is, is back. Um, they were in Cuba worshiping with our believers there uh, last week, and uh, uh, we've got some encouraging reports of that, and you can look forward to, I believe, next week during the service, we'll, they'll give us a little bit more of a, um, an update on that trip progress, or you can find folks that were there and, and talk about it and get to hear uh, a little bit more. Um, so I want you to know about those things. Uh, also, some of y'all will be familiar with a discipleship opportunity Crossgate has done uh, for years over the past, the kind of a SALT uh, program focused on um, uh, scripture and accountability, leadership training, but just a time of being, getting a few folks together to say we want to intentionally uh, meet regularly to be focused in God's Word, uh, growing from His Word and holding one another and supporting one another in that. Uh, so there's been various small groups that have done this. It's usually three or four guys or girls uh, meeting together to, um, to take up uh, this, uh, this study. And, and some of the guys who've done this before said, we would love to get another group together for this. Um, so if you just hear this language in the bulletin of a discipleship opportunity and that you would love to be meeting with some other guys or meeting with some other ladies to, to study God's word, be praying for one another and intentionally taking those steps toward growth, uh, please let me know. Uh, guys, if you could talk to uh, Bill, Bill Jones or Craig uh, Whitman, we're wanting to stir that up. Uh, some of the ladies have done this before as well, but just wanted to put that out there to you. We may uh, start a, 
uh, uh, do a short Sunday school thing that will also kind of tell you a little bit more about that uh, coming up in May. But I wanted to, to put that in front of you uh, and encourage you uh, toward, in whatever sense, that God is calling us to grow in Him. Uh, he's doing that through his word. And whether it's this opportunity or taking up other things, we want to continue to, uh, to challenge you in that and to encourage you in that direction. Uh, another thing that God's word is always calling us to do is to, to serve one another and to serve him. And there are tons of different ways you do that in your own life and through the church. Uh, but particularly, we want to mention um, an outreach opportunity. And on Sunday afternoons, there's a group, some of you may not know this, uh, there's a group from Crossgate uh, that regularly goes over to, to Belvedere Commons, the assisted living uh, facility just across the road next to OCA, uh, from 3.30 to 4.15 just to have kind of a, a devotion and a, and a worship service for them. Uh, a lot of those residents aren't able to get out, and it's so good to have someone come in and just sing some, some joyful songs with one another um, and, uh, and, and just have a time of encouragement. But it is so helpful to have some members that can walk around just to know them or help some of those residents get to the right pages on their book and, and so on. Uh, so if you would be willing to spend just a little bit of your time on a Sunday afternoon uh, to go over there and encourage these, uh, these folks in, in worship, uh, we would love for you to participate in that. Bob and Ellen Bell have been um, uh, leading this for a time, so if you have some time on Sunday afternoon, uh, please speak to them. You can talk to me as well, but speak to them. Even this Sunday, you can get out there and just say, well, I want to try it out one Sunday and see what that's like. But there's a good group of folks who've been helping out with that. Um, and if it's something where you say, you know, I'd love to do that sometimes, but maybe I can't do that every week. Well, we can probably set something up so for you know, these folks are on these weeks and that and another. But anyway, this, and we could use some more, um, more volunteers helping with that. And so I just wanted to uh, stir you up toward that opportunity. And you can talk with the Bells uh, more about that. Uh, but we are here uh, this morning for the great privilege of meeting with God. Uh, that he calls us into his presence to meet with him. And he doesn't say, this is only for the good people. Or well, this is for the people who have got everything right or done everything well, uh, because if so, then, then who could stand and who could come? Uh, but because Christ has come, uh, because he's made a way for us into God's presence where our sins are forgiven and we get to receive uh, his goodness and his blessing, we get to meet with God in joy together. We get to celebrate what he's done. We get to share that with one another. Uh, so we come into God's presence by, by God's command and by his blessing, uh, remembering who he is. So here, uh, God's call to worship uh, this morning comes from just verse 22 of uh, Psalm 34. It focuses on redemption and salvation, and that we are not condemned through Jesus. It says, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, we come to you and worship this morning to take refuge in you. Uh, refuge that you are the one who has all life and abundance and surety and blessing, who gives peace and hope and encouragement, uh, that you are the source of all joy. And so we pray that you would allow joy to overflow uh, from our hearts this morning. We thank you that coming into your presence doesn't mean uh, being uh, condemned, but being redeemed by your life, by your love for us that you have shown through your Son. Oh, Lord, lift up our hearts, work in us by the power of your Spirit, that we might uh, know your presence with us and your help, and that you might receive our worship. For you, O oh Lord, are worthy of it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great God, with highest hand, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all, then reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain, that resists your me, take me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love. 
love within and no taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me. Through the gospel of your Son, gave me endless hope. CGC class with uh, at least a thought that kind of stuck in my head a little bit is, is how we are prone to, as we said, wallowing in our sin and depravity. And it's just, it seems comfortable. It's like we deserve that. And we just, uh, as somebody shares like that, I just, you don't know how I live. You don't know what it's like for me. And yet, what would you say, what did we just sing about? Great God of highest heaven occupies our lowly hearts. Um, and, and just an encouragement that we've been adopted into his family. And so uh, we sing this next one, Come Ye Sinners. Maybe we could change that. Come ye children, we are sinners. We're poor, we're wretched. But guess what? Jesus stands ready to save you. He's full of pity and he's full of power. Come ye sinners. Sin is poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is able. Thank you. 
feel your need of Him. This He gives you. This He gives you. Tis the Spirit's rising need. Though the incarnate God ascended, He's the merit of Holy, let no other trust in truth. None but Jesus, none but Jesus can do helpless sinners good. Come, ye needy, come and welcome. God's free bounty glorified. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I love the fact that we've sung those two songs in sequence there. We sing about this great God that we worship who is so far high and beyond our understanding, yet at the same time, He invites us, lowly sinners, to come before Him. And even now as we continue in our worship, we have opportunity to confess our sin before God, believing that Jesus, none but Jesus, can do helpless sinners good. So I'd invite you now to join me as we confess confess this sin together. Lord Jesus, I have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief and of neglect to seek you in my daily life. My sins and shortcomings present me with a list of accusation, but I thank you that they will not stand against me, for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver me from every evil habit, every interest of former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in me and everything that prevents me taking delight in you. Amen. Indeed, we confess these things to God, believing them to be true about our own hearts. It's vulnerable, it's open. But in the same way, God's free grace is extended to us. The good news of His gospel, the assurance of His pardon This morning we have an assurance of pardon taken from Romans chapter 8. It says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is good news indeed, and it's promised to us for the increase of our faith. And so we respond here, my faith looks up to thee. And I'd invite you to stand if you're able as we respond in song now. Oh, may my love to Thee 
dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me pray with me now. Oh, Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for your goodness and your kindness toward us, that we who were strangers and enemies and even hostile to God have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You continue to turn your face toward us in kindness and compassion toward poor and needy sinners. We realize how desperately we need you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, on our behalf, took on all of the accusations that stood against us, all those things which we wholeheartedly deserved in our sin, yet you did not deserve being perfect and holy and completely righteous. Thank you that you took all our sin upon your shoulders, you bore it on our behalf, so that we might, by faith, receive your righteousness, that you would take off our filthy rags of sin and clothe us in your perfect and holy and pure righteousness, that we can stand before a holy and righteous God in confidence, knowing that we are accepted in Christ. We are not condemned, but we are pardoned and welcomed in. Father, we thank you for adopting us into your family for making orphans your sons and daughters, bringing wayward people into your home and conforming us into the image of your dear Son. You've given us your Holy Spirit so that by the power of the Spirit and the Word, you can form us into His image day by day. Thank you for this work that you are doing in us, even this morning, making us more like Jesus as we rest in Him and receive Him by faith and feed upon His Word. Holy Spirit, we thank You for the work of comfort that You provide in our hearts, of conviction, of enlightenment, that by the power of Your Word, You bring out those areas of sin that we try to hide from You, but You also guide us into the way of peace when we are lost and in the dark. Lord, we pray that Your Spirit would work among us this morning. I pray for the soul that may be battling doubt and unbelief, and sometimes we choose to listen to the voice of the accuser shouting those accusations against us and railing against us, but we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you stand before us, that your promises are yes and amen, they are true, and we can look to them by faith, take hold of them, and be strengthened. I pray for the one who is wrestling with doubt, that by the power of your word you may reveal yourself, make yourself known to them, even this morning. We pray for those who are hurting, those who are longing for loved ones that have been lost, those who are mourning even recent losses of life. Would you comfort them by your Holy Spirit? Would you come alongside and lift up the brokenhearted, those who are lowly in heart, would you condescend toward us and lift us up to give us a foretaste of that which is to come, that this light momentary affliction is but for a moment, but the promises of eternity are forever. 
Lord, would your, the light of your eternity break over the darkness of our difficult days right now? Would you give us even a glimpse of what you have promised us, what belongs to us in our inheritance as your sons and daughters? Lord, we pray for this church. I thank you for Crossgate and how you have grown her and what you are doing in our midst. We continue to pray for a unified congregational life, that we would be a unified body of believers seeking to grow true disciples as we ourselves learn what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. I pray for programs like SALT in these areas of our lives where we meet one-on-one, where we keep each other accountable, we pray for one another, we encourage one another. Lord, would you build up these programs in our midst for our growth, for our edification, and for your glory. We pray for Crossgate's leadership, for her session, for her diaconate, for so many lay leaders who are involved in various ministries. Would you continue to enable and equip to protect us, to keep us free from error or division even, or controversy? Would you keep us a pure church watching and waiting for our Lord Jesus? Oh Lord, we long for your return. We long for you to come and to make all things new, to wipe away every tear from our eyes, to completely eradicate the power of sin once and for all, that we will no longer battle with it, but we will be in your presence forever. We long for that day, and we say with John, even so come, Lord Jesus. But once again this morning, would you give us even just a glimpse of your beauty, of your glory as we look into your word? Pray that you would enable David as he stands before us and speaks to us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I'd invite you now to stand once again, if you're able, as we sing, Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
We love our kids at Crossgate, and young kids are welcome to be in the service or in the nursery, and kids three through six, if you want to go out to the kids' uh, worship in room five, you're welcome uh, to do that. And if you're still in the service, I'd pray that I'd ask you to turn with me to uh, the book of Acts. We'll be in Acts uh, chapter 25 and Acts chapter 26 uh, this morning. Um, so we're going to look at uh, those two chapters as we make our way through uh, the book of Acts, and we're uh, getting fairly near the end. If you look a little further, there's just two more chapters after this, 27 and 28, and we'll uh, wrap up the series here in, uh, at the end of April. Um, but we'll take these two chapters together, and as you hear it this morning, you'll, you'll realize why. Most of chapter 26 is Paul recounting his conversion again, uh, but you'll also hear this, uh, this narrative as a whole kind of sticks together. Um, We've, uh, we've seen Paul as he was making his way to Jerusalem, uh, and the Spirit had warned him that there was imprisonment waiting for him there, and, and sure enough, uh, he was um, attacked uh, while he was in the temple there. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the Roman centurion who, who sees this and kind of rescues him, and they deal with this, and he eventually, because he's going to be ambushed, this whole um, uh, controversy as it takes place in Jerusalem is moved out to uh, Caesarea, still under Roman custody, and waiting for these accusations to be dealt with. And even though they're called up time and again, uh, there's, there's not any real uh, substance to those accusations, and yet two years uh, under, under the governor, Roman governor Felix, he just waited um, in, in under Roman custody in Caesarea. As we come into Acts 25, we'll find that a, that a new Roman governor has come, uh, Festus, and it, it won't be a, a whole lot different. Yet you'll still see the same controversy being dealt with, but now it begins to take a, a movement further of how God is going to lead through this. What we've seen all the way uh, through the book of Acts and that we're getting to, especially in cha chapter 28, is this, this theme that with all these obstacles and even uh, this greatest missionary of the church being kind of stuck in Caesarea for these two years, um, that, that God's work is not being hampered. It, it goes forward unhindered. Uh, that none of these obstacles that seem so much like they get in the way actually slow down what Jesus is doing. They're actually the means that he's using uh, to spread the truth of the gospel over the face of the earth. And then he continues to do so uh, through us. So this morning we'll see how uh, Paul uh, responds and answers and points uh, to Christ uh, in this passage as his uh, accusations continue to come against him. But before we read the passage, would you, uh, would you pray with me? Lord our God, we thank you for your word. Uh, that you have the truth and that you speak it to us, uh, that we may know uh, what you have done, who you are, uh, how you have given your son and given life to us, how you have established a church and a people that you call to yourself from every uh, language, tribe, and nation, and how you grew that church from Jerusalem uh, to here in Seneca and continue to grow it around the world. Lord, we thank you for that great work of redemption that we get to be a part of through your Son. As we take up your word uh, this morning, Lord, we ask that you would be working through it, that it would not be only uh, words that we read or history that we hear, but as you tell us, these are words of life. Lord, breathe life into us. Bring grace and refreshment, hope and forgiveness and confidence and boldness and, and living for you. Uh, Lord, work by the power of your Spirit as you've promised. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Acts chapter 25, and as I said, we'll read the whole of chapters 25 and 26, and so I would encourage you to, uh, to listen. Uh, just that it's, a, that it's a story, it's well told and well put together. If it's more helpful for you to just look up and listen, uh, then listen that way. If it's more helpful for you to read, read along, uh, but hear how God tells uh, these events uh, to us through Luke uh, in this chapter. Uh, Acts chapter 25 and 26, hear the word of God. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning to ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept in, in Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And 
if there's anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he had stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed to Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. As they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there's a man left prisoner by Felix. When I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met with the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, and the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion about a certain Jesus, who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes, with the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who were present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write, my lord, about him. Therefore, I have brought him here before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable and sending a prisoner, not to indicate the charges against him. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest part of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by, God to our, made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to obtain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, 
I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so. In Jerusalem, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them, even the foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commissioning of the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who uh, journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise. And stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason... The Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you... But all those who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. The grass withers and the flower fades, uh, but the word of the Lord is uh, forever. And so among us uh, this morning. It's a long passage, but I hope you can hear just that event and how God is, is working through it. Uh, and it's fascinating when you see the character of Paul within this and, and how he responds with it. And I want to draw our attention back to, to words we saw early in the service from that uh, assurance of pardon. Uh, Words that Paul wrote several years before uh, to the church in Rome, uh, where he said, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in 
Christ Jesus. You might wonder when it comes to Acts 25 and 26 if Paul uh, still thinks that now, even as he remains under trial uh, and under condemnation, uh, waiting for the verdict. I think most of us, if we were in Paul's uh, shoes, we would be uh, kind of shaking in our boots at such a moment. Uh, Being brought before the Roman governor, being brought before uh, King Agrippa, who was king over the the Jewish uh, region and had authority over them through Rome as well, and all this great company, and and hearing all these accusations and and trumped up charges being brought out again, we would be shaking, having at least be worn out after two years of not being released, and maybe not particularly hopeful of what might come uh, from it. Paul says, there's therefore no condemnation, but when it comes to this trial, uh, to be condemned or not to be condemned is the question, and and it's not a foregone conclusion of how will they respond uh, to Paul and how will he be dealt with. What's so fascinating as we read through this narrative and watch Paul's responses in it is, is he doesn't seem fearful at all, does he? Uh, He's not cowering down in any sense. Uh, He's not reserved. He's not holding back. He's not kissing up to them to hope to kind of appeal to them that they would like him enough that then everything might be smooth over. But to the contrary, he's bold. Uh, he, is, he is evangelistic. Uh, he's standing up to opposition. He has far more words in this passage than either Festus or Agrippa, and his words really seem to control the, the narrative. And, and we notice he's not just defending himself. When Paul speaks, it's not that he is, he is desperately pleading that someone will finally listen to the truth of justice, that someone will finally see that he's, that he's innocent. No, he's, he's speaking boldly and straightforwardly and with a purpose that isn't just to clear his own name. Paul really seems to be the one, as the narrative unfolds, that he's the one kind of leading the course of events. Uh, leading how it, how it goes, except, as he would say, uh, probably rattling the chains at the end there, except for these chains. Uh, but he's setting the conversation and the topic and the point and the purpose of it. So as we look at this passage, it's this, I think it's this uncondemned status that gives Paul that boldness, that gives him that freedom and that confidence and that purposefulness to speak the way that he speaks in this passage. He doesn't know how Festus or Agrippa or others will respond with words of, of condemnation from the trial or, 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 or in some other way. But he knows the verdict that God has given, that there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so while he's not free at liberty to just go where he wants, he remains under Roman custody. He has this, this freedom given from God to even as he's imprisoned, under custody and under accusation, to speak boldly, uh, to live uh, boldly before God, uh, not needing to just clear uh, his name. As we we look at this and see Paul's response and this uncondemned uh, status before God that guides Paul's action, we, we do so not merely just looking at the history of it, what Paul did or said or felt, but as that passage says, that's those who, uh, there's therefore now no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. And so that that uncondemned status should be something that changes and reflects how we live in the world, how we relate to others, what we speak about, how it guides our actions, what we should do and feel and and say and why. Or as Paul puts it at the end of that narrative, uh, what does he want? That all might be like him. Want all to be like me, knowing Christ, knowing his, his forgiveness and his purpose and his calling on their life and, and living for him. So as we go through the passage, I want us to just ask ourselves this question, what would it be like to live as uncondemned? And you're like, that's, that's easy for me. I don't have any charges placed against me. <laughs> you can check my background check. It's clear. I'm good. And, and yet, man, some of the things that, that tie me up most during the week or wear me out, uh, is, is worry about condemnation. And I expect that you're probably not that much different. And it's, and it's not necessarily God's condemnation. Uh, a lot of time it's my own words of condemnation if I haven't met this standard or what about this. Or, or sometimes it's just imaginary conversations. Uh, that if this person, maybe they would say this. Or maybe someone expected that I would do that. And, and, and what if this? And it just, it just drags us down. 
uh, I have a tendency, I think we all have this tendency to live worrying about those verdicts of condemnation that might be pronounced against us. And God gives us a freedom to rest in his pronouncement that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Though we have sinned, it's been placed on Jesus and he frees us then to, to live for him. As we see in Paul in this passage, living in that freedom, even though under custody. What would it be like to live as uncondemned? We'll look at three sides of the passage, and I apologize, I had not used enough unwords in the series. <laughs> and we're getting near the end, so I just piled a bunch of them on there. Uh, here's the, I think you'll see some of the reason for it, but here, the, the first section, what we're looking at, not just, uh, instead of breaking up the section by verses, we're going through it more by perspective. Uh, first, we want to look at the whole thing under the perspective of Festus. Right, here, here's Festus who has to deal with Paul, uh, and how does he respond? What do we see within him and some of the other uh, characters within it that, that aren't believing in Christ and yet are in this position? Uh, and what's that world perspective on this one who, who lives uh, before God? But then secondly, we'll look and see how does Paul respond here? Uh, what is Paul's perspective on uh, these things, even when he's under these charges? And it really is one that's not just about Paul. Wow, well, wouldn't he amazing? It's one that should guide the tone of how we live, of how we respond. But then thirdly, even though the passage doesn't call direct attention to, to what God is doing, what we're always to be looking at when we're studying Scripture is saying, what is God doing here? What is God's perspective on these events and what is He uh, working out of it? Uh, so first we'll see that, that worldly uh, perspective uh, from Festus, Agrippa, uh, the Jews and their accusation, this uh, uncertain and unreasonable uh, response to it. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, Festus comes in as this new governor, Felix having let Paul sit for two hours, two, two, uh, two years, uh, if only it was two hours, <laughs> two years, and then um, uh, Festus comes in as this new governor and immediately, uh, once he's down in Jerusalem, this area that he's supposed to come uh, deal with, uh, the Jews come to him and what are they concerned about? This Paul guy. We got to deal with this Paul guy. He's been in prison, hadn't been able to do very much for two years, and still, what's their primary concern? Uh, th this Paul. And Festus is uncertain what to do with Paul. In fact, the narrative in many ways developed around this theme of the accusations that, that couldn't be proved. If you want to look at your Bible, I'll kind of take you through some of them. You just see again and again uh, how it repeats this. First, in, uh, in chapter 25, verse 7. Uh, we see it saying these uh, many serious charges against him that they could not prove. And again, in verse 11, uh, Paul comments as that there's nothing to their charges against me. And so he goes on and, uh, and appeals uh, to Caesar. In verse 18, we see Festus as he's describing it to Agrippa. That when the accusers uh, came, they brought no charge against his case of such evils as I su suspected. Wasn't there really anything that he had, he had done wrong with it? And even when the whole assembly is gathered, uh, Agrippa, Bernice, and these other prominent persons that are there, as Festus describes it, he says, they petitioned me about him, but in verse 25, that he had done nothing deserving death. And that great response at the end of the chapter, that why are they having this big gathering of pulp and having Paul talk about it? Because Festus doesn't know what to write about it. <laughs> He's got an answer to Caesar for why he's sending this guy there. And he's like, I don't even know any charges that make that make sense. But listen to it and we'll see what we can come up with, how uh, we deal with it. Um, and then uh, Paul responds before it and then concluding uh, as after Paul's response, they all look and say, this man is doing nothing deserving death or imprisonment. Right? He could have been freed if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. And so we come and we go, well, well, why wasn't he? It doesn't make any sense to send him to Caesar. It doesn't make any sense to do this. Well, well what happened? Why? What motivated all these things along with it that Paul remains in, in prison here? And Festus, I think, is that representative of the worldly perspective that is, is really uncertain of their own standing, uh, un uncertain of their own significance uh, and standing and position and needs to justify itself. That's why Festus and the Jews and Agrippa respond the way that they do. 
All right, first you see this perspective in the, in the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews as they, uh, they waste no time coming to deal with this Paul situation. Um, and, and the perspective that you get is, is they can't bear Paul's continued existence. That somehow it, it challenges and undermines their religion, their self, their position, uh, their, their authority for him not to be condemned. In other words, to put it this way, uh, that their opposition is so uh, weak and so, such an attempt to justify themselves by having uh, Paul uh, removed or asking for Paul to be removed. Their, their mindset is that one that, that condemns others in order to approve themselves. We all fall into that some. But you can see the weakness of it here, uh, that they feel so threatened by his existence that they're planning this unreasonable ambush, and it exposes their own certainty. That they need his death in order to even kind of be able to feel okay about themselves. They're not living as uncondemned, but they feel this uncertainty and this weakness of it. Um, we still, I think, see so much of that in the opposition in our times too. Uh, whether it's the pol polarization or different positions, that sometimes you realize that people in their commitment to their position are still so weak and so un uncertain that they almost become unhinged by disagreement. If they have to hear that someone else has a different position than them, it's like stick their fingers in their ears and go, ah, I can't hear you, right? Like this, this can't be here. That, that other side has to be dealt, uh, done with and removed in order that maybe then we could be okay. And sometimes on both sides of the, of the polarization, that same perspective, and it just exposes that this, this weakness and this need for justification that's not uh, from God, that we're trying to make for ourselves by condemning others. On the other side of it, when you look at how Festus responds and how Agrippa responds, what they're really trying to do is they almost see Paul as a, as a plaything, as a pawn for their purposes. Right? Festus has to decide how to respond. Well, well, he's the leader over this region. It tends to be an area with a lot of conflict, and he's looking for how can he have a better relationship with the Jews. And he realizes pretty quickly that if he gives what would be justice and releases Paul, then they're going to continue to be upset with him. But he's like, well, maybe I can do a favor to them and just have Paul sent to Jerusalem and we'll see how this goes, All right? Uh, he's not looking for justice, but he's looking to promote himself uh, and his position and just using Paul along with it, that perspective of using others to advance self that we fall into so quickly. But it really exposes how much Festus' position is one that is weak, that isn't stable, uh, that he feels like unless he can kind of work these deals and continue to plot this course and advance himself, it might all just fall apart. As many uh, Roman governors or Roman leaders who didn't please the emperor suddenly uh, lost that position. And so he's just taking the opportunities there to say, well, how can I use it for myself? And you can't help but read through the narrative and hear the uncertainty of it and the unreasonable things that it leads to uh, without any stability and hopefulness, just a confusion along with it. You see how much when we don't know that we are uh, uncondemned, that we're always trying to self-justify. We're always trying to use people or, or condemn others to make our own place or standard uh, more set. And it only leads toward more uncertainty. But we see the contrast with Paul. When we look at how Paul uh, responds here, uh, that he is, uh, we could say, unapologetic and, and unfazed. Even though there's this huge, and at one point this um, incredibly great pomp, this incredible prominent men that are gathered against him, and he's answering to the Roman governor and to King Herod Agrippa II, who would be that uh, earthly Jewish uh, king over the, the Jewish people, even though he'd uh, been in Rome for some time. Um, uh, he, Paul's, that's Paul's audience. Uh, and Paul is under accusation to have to make a stand for himself. And while Paul does present his case of defense, uh, he's, not, he, he's unapologetic. There's nothing he's saying, here's what I did wrong, or here's how I can appease you with it. Uh, and he's unfazed, unmoved, unchanged in his purpose. And it's continuing with the purpose that Christ has called him to from that road in Damascus. And he takes the opportunity to, to tell them about it. 
Listen, several years before uh, Paul was in Jerusalem or, or, or in, in Caesarea here, uh, he'd written some words in 1 Corinthians 4 that I think are very helpful to us. He said this, With me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Well, here we have Paul in a human court. And true to what he said, he appears to consider it not the weightiest thing. His standing before God, his worth, his value, his significance, his youthfulness are not dependent upon how that human court responds. And doesn't it show in how Paul speaks? On how Paul cares about his audience and how Paul stands up for not only himself, but for, for God's work and for what God is doing in that, that going forward. So he tells us why it's a, it's a small thing, and it's not because he's because uh, judgment doesn't matter, it's because he's more concerned with, with the Lord who judges. But the Lord has shown, has pronounced his judgment in Christ that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All those things that Paul had guilt on have been placed upon Jesus. And his spirit is working within Paul to, for him to live uh, toward God. And so he, he re can rest in God's judgment, in God's justice and in God's mercy and salvation in him. Paul knows he's uncondemned by God, and it leads him not to cower, uh, not to respond aggressively or respond defensively, uh, but, to, but to speak plainly and clearly and boldly uh, for the Lord. We'll see, as Paul walks through, the, instead of a weak position, Paul has a, has a strong, he has some backbone here even when he responds to him, uh, even though he doesn't respond aggressively. He does defend himself, but he doesn't get defensive. He doesn't start throwing accusations back or he doesn't do uh, so much else. What do we see Paul uh, responding in um, uh, <clears throat> on those first verses there? As he, uh, he talks about it in verse 8. He argued in his defense, very strong argument, neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. Let's just go to the bare facts. <laughs> the, the accusations aren't true. Uh, there's nothing there that should just hold within it. Um, uh, Paul is just responding right to it. He hasn't, he's not afraid of death if he's committed anything that deserves it. And so he appeals to Caesar. You see, he's not, he's not just going to be used. Uh, they may consider him their pawn, but, but Paul says, no, there's another purpose that I have that God is after, and I, I don't just have to let you use me either. And I can stand up and I can make this appeal uh, to Caesar because Festus is not his hope. And Caesar is not his hope, but the Lord Jesus Christ is his hope, and so Paul can walk in that confidence. Uh, Paul has this uh, incredible audience that, that comes. You notice it mentions not just Agrippa and, and Bernice along with, uh, uh, um, uh, along with Festus, but men of the tribune and, and prominent men of the city. Uh, if you wanted to see an influential gathering of who's who in Caesarea, uh, it, it was here and it was present uh, to hear Paul. Uh, an incredible opportunity as he looks at it. And he, he begins his defense. And note how much as Paul defends himself, um, how much Paul relates to others in it. And he relates to them as someone who's already approved. And so as he defends his case, instead of just trying to show others how, how he really is better than them, what does he go to? He says, listen, yes, I was of this party of the, of the Pharisees, and also when I heard about this Jesus of Nazareth, do you know what I did? I said, let's be rid of them. Let's be done with, with all of them. And I cast my vote so that they would be, um, uh, so that they would be killed. And I went and found them in other places, and I essentially tortured them to try to make them uh, blaspheme. And I, I traveled not just to Damascus, but to various cities so I could find wherever these people were hiding so we could pull all of them out and, and be done with them all. Right? He's like, that was my position. He's, he's owning up uh, to what he would describe in other places of Scripture as, as some of the deepest sins that he's most ashamed of. Uh, because there also, even when he was on the road to Damascus, Jesus spoke to him. 
called him out, called him by name. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul's relating, though, uh, to these that he's speaking to. He's not just trying to, 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 to gain some other status uh, from them, but he's, he's showing his own sin, his own faults within it, and yet that God uh, worked through that. He's not, he's not desperate. He's not hiding uh, the truth. He's not defensive, but he's, he's glad to give a reason for the hope within him. He's glad to give a reason for, for why he believes and why his confidence rests in Christ and, and why he behaves as he does to tell Jews and Gentiles in all these places that that hope that was promised in Scripture of Jesus as the Messiah has come because Jesus spoke even to him when he was on the wrong way and called him to himself and said he would use him for this purpose. Is that the way that we relate to others? Are we willing to, to tell our story that way? Uh, not just when we respond to those accusations or when we worry about someone thinks of us, don't we try to just put the best impression of ourselves in front of everyone else? Or we kind of leave out certain details and then just promote uh, the other things that make us look good. And that's, that's not what Paul does here. Uh, but he even opens up his own, his own sins and his own lostness before God spoke to him. He does so, though, in order to, to relate to them and call them toward Christ. So you note that Paul in this passage is so uh, incredibly evangelistic as he, as he speaks about it. Uh, Paul, as he uh, brings uh, this passage, he knows that he's uncondemned. He's written in Romans 8, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, not Festus, not Agrippa, not Caesar. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who has died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And if you know that passage, it goes on, shall, shall rulers and authorities, shall principalities and powers separate us from the love of Christ? No. So Paul, as he's here, even in this moment, isn't crushed under it. He stands in the love of God, sharing the love of God with others, pointing to them. He becomes very evangelistic as he responds to him. He's not, he's not trying to advance himself. He's not trying to advance uh, his own reputation or his own significance, but he does speak to others in order to advance the gospel, to advance the knowledge of, of who God is and what he has done. Right, This defense before the prominent pomp full audience is another opportunity for witness, and Paul is, is unmoved by the, the influence of the power of the people around him. Uh, it doesn't shift him off of his goal. It's like, God called me to represent him to, uh, to, to his own people and to the Gentiles and the kings and those in authority, and you, you may be thinking that you're accusing me and I have to defend myself, but, but I'm here to tell you about who God is how he worked in my life, and what he calls you to. Already by verse 8, he's speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. Right? Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? This is the hope that the scriptures have always proclaimed uh, that I'm speaking about. Um, he, he speaks all through here. He's, he's, his, his words as he tells the story are focused around the core of that gospel. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. And that calling to repentance, that, that freedom of forgiveness that's given even to the Gentiles, that, that call of repentance and deeds and keeping with repentance. Uh, he says, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly uh, vision, but I was called to proclaim light to those who are in darkness, both to the Jew and to the Gentile, that here's the one who is their Savior. And he's, he's so clear about this and so direct about this uh, that you get this interruption, don't you? Here's Paul speaking about this, and Festus is like, Paul, you've lost your mind. Uh, are you going crazy and insane? Because, because Festus gets the implications of what Paul's saying. He's saying Jesus is Lord over everyone and everything and has provided a way of salvation for all who would come to him, Jew and Gentile. And Festus's position is kind of to represent Rome even among this, uh, this Jewish-influenced area. Uh, and he knows how much the conflict of those interests is, is constantly uh, hard to keep the peace in. And now he hears Paul saying the truth of the scripture is that there is this one hope that is Jesus both for the Romans 
and for the Jews, both for the Gentiles and, and for uh, the Jews, for all people. And he's like, Paul, you're, you're crazy. How's Paul respond? I'm not crazy. I'm speaking very true things, very clear things, very public things. It wasn't done in a corner. It's very well known. And then he, he speaks to, directly to Agrippa. And man, you just watch in this narrative how much the tables are turned, right? Here's Paul under accusation, the people of, of most power and influence in the society where he is. He's having to answer to them, and he's saying, what I believe and what the heavenly vision told me to proclaim is that Jesus really is that Messiah that the prophets have always talked about. And then he addresses King Agrippa particularly and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa has to respond. Uh, Paul, who is under accusation, doesn't throw accusations at Agrippa, but he, he calls him. He calls him to respond, not to Paul, uh, but to the Lord. Uh, as he says, he wishes that he could call all that audience and all that hear him today, as he continues to go on, uh, that they would hear that message of that hope that comes from God, that here's the opportunity for forgiveness of sins. Here's the, opposition, the opportunity to no longer be trying to, to justify ourselves and, and trump up either condemnation of others or advance ourselves to a position where we feel like we're, we're stable or important enough. But here's an opportunity to be, to be loved by God, to be accepted by Him, to have our guilt placed upon a Christ and His righteousness given to us so that we have a secure standing and purpose and calling before God. He calls Agrippa to that. Agrippa has to answer. Would you, would you have me become a Christian? You're just trying to convert me in this? And Paul says, yep, cards are on the table. Wasn't trying to hide that. <laughs> Not just you, but everyone. This is what God has called me to do. He says, except for these chains. I Here's the part that doesn't make sense. The rest of it is the hope of the gospel that God brings. And we're called to have that same response. So he's not just pushing his evangelism, uh, but he gets the confidence to speak so boldly because he's uncondemned before God and offers that same hope to others. Well, lastly and, and briefly, um, uh, he's, he's given that ministry of reconciliation from God and he carries that on. But, uh, but lastly and briefly then, this unseen uh, and unhindered. It's important to look at this text and ask, what's God doing here? Um, uh, it doesn't simply say, well, God did this, but it's still all orchestrated by God. And even though Paul remains in chains at the end of this chapter, you can see Paul's, God's working out his purpose. You go back to chapter 23 and verse 11, where Jesus appeared to Paul and said, uh, you'll bear witness for me in Rome also. I bet Paul didn't think that was going to be the means through which he might be traveling to Rome. Uh, we'll see in the next chapter, this is his ticket. <laughs> Uh, and now that the things are on their way for him to testify before Caesar and Rome, this is what God was doing, what God was bringing about. And not only that, but Luke's has created this whole uh, section, these striking parallels between Jesus' trial uh, and Jesus' condemnation at the hands of, of Pilate and of Herod. Uh, and even as they joined together in that. And this is, this is Herod Agrippa II, a different, uh, different Herod. And, and uh, Ephesus is not Pilate and Herod. But you see them still bringing this partnership together around what do we do with this representative of God's word. But while, while on the one hand it led toward Christ's condemnation for us, because Christ was, was condemned in our place, died on the cross, and yet was vindicated in his resurrection that we have hope. Now he is reigning, and he is able to operate. He's the one who is orchestrating all these things. He is the one who is reigning through it. And so while Luke is clear that um, even in Christ's death, that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, how so much more here we also see Christ as the one ruling over all things and ruling over this, and so that Paul is not simply uh, condemned, but so his purposes continue to go forward. And so that Christianity and the Christian faith is, is uncondemned. There's nothing wrong with what Paul was saying, not before the Jews, not before our religious things, not before Caesar and the emperor, not before true religion or before the power of the state, but it spreads the hope of salvation all through the middle of it, is what we're called to do. 
And we do that not just by condemning the other side and not just by promoting ourselves, uh, but by living as, as uncondemned uh, and as sharing that hope of the gospel uh, with others. Uh, John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. So often that's the way we approach God, it's just this condemnation. God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the Son of God, but Jesus has come that we may know him, that we may believe in him and not be condemned. And that hope is not just us, that's what we get to offer to the world, and that's what we get to stand in. Let's live as those who are not condemned, uh, but have been justified in Christ, living for him. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, we pray uh, that you would give us that freedom that we see in Paul, uh, this humility, uh, this boldness to serve you, uh, to not just be trying to use the situations for ourselves or to be used by uh, those situations, but in every situation to, to, stand, before, to stand for you uh, because Jesus has been given for us. Lord, how great is our hope, how quickly our guilt or sorrow or false guilt even uh, drives us down. And yet, Lord, your verdict is clear. That there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, even for us, and for the world around us, that we might offer that hope to them. Pray that you would work through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we close? Our living hope. How great a chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Oh, hallelujah, praise the one who sent me. Your buried body.
body began to breathe out of the silence a roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me oh jesus yours is a then go out uh, living in that hope as God sends us out with his blessing upon his people. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.